Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Tides of Death. We are here with Pokemon Challenges. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I am great. Uh, and we're going to learn a little bit about your character. Um, first off, what is your character's name? My character's name is Archie B. Alder. Excellent. Why does that sound so familiar to me? Probably because it kind of sounds like Archibald, right? Oh. Ah, there we go. Archie Bald, Archie Bald. I see what's happening. I see. You're smarter than me. Um, we're gonna pick up your character's backstory a long, long time ago, before you really uh, met Captain John Winter. Before you met the rest of the crew, we're gonna go back in time to when you were a young lad, and someone screwed you over someone that you were close yes. to someone that you were friends with or had a lot of trust in uh, who yes. is this person that you trusted to have your back that fucked you over? well i would imagine since archie um was separated from his parents by one way or another um fairly early in his life um i could imagine that before he joined the military he was just kind of out on the streets of the town, you know, following people um, that he thought he could trust, that he thought, uh, you know, he could make, uh, form a bond with or, or that, that could, like, guide him through this, like, very troubling um, setting that he grows up in, right? Because mm -hmm. um, he was all alone. So he needed to find someone that could guide him. So maybe he met a person out there when he was young who he thought he could trust and then wronged him ah so after what before we get into that then what was the circumstance of you departing your family or your family departing um, you i think this was something that happened fairly early in archie's life that he barely remembers um merely maybe because of trauma um but pretty much ever since he can think he's he has like hazy memories of his family, but mostly he remembers like being alone in like a very, maybe not even a house, but some sort of like um, living situation where he was just kind of all on his own and had to fend for his own and eventually leave that place because it would just not be livable for him anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you will be a young lad on the streets of a significant town. Um, we're going to say Clydesdale. It is the sure. capital city of Wake County, probably where you grew up. And um, you're a young boy defending for yourself on the streets of Clydesdale when you meet a person. A person who is a middle-aged woman who's going to take you in, help you, survive for a little bit her name have a name in mind for this woman um what about you. okay okay uh, her name is amber amber yes at least that's the name she tells you so amber finds you on the streets one day where you're struggling to get by and survive. You're walking yes. through one of these side passages of Clydesdale, looking for little bits of scraps that people might have thrown out when Amber, not a particularly well-dressed woman, her clothes are used. Um, she's got that sort of, not quite street urchin quality about her, but that like really lower class quality about her. Her face is yeah. dirty, her hair is sort of matted. It's clear that she cuts it herself with a dagger. So it kind of like, it's not, it's like going all over the place, weird lengths. Um, you'll see that she has a knife tucked in her belt at her side that she tries to keep covered with a long shirt. Um, and she sees you in one of these back alleys looking for scraps and calls you over with a warm biscuit in hand. And we're talking American biscuits, not British biscuits. Got it. So the good ones. That's the right answer. You can start two levels higher. <laughs> <laughs> um, she calls you over with a warm biscuit in hand. 
what are you gonna do? Um, well, I'm obviously very enticed. I'm very hungry, and I can smell the biscuit, the like butteriness, the the I I can like almost see how like it's it's like flaky and and wonderful, and I probably Steaming. haven't eaten something proper in a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. So, um, I think I'll definitely be enticed. I'll be a little bit skeptical, a little bit, um, wary, but I'm so hungry, and uh, this person seems, um, d doesn't seem very threatening to me, so I'm gonna mm -hmm. move over to her, and, um, just, may maybe just so I can smell the biscuit a little bit better. Yeah. She sees you coming forward and says, don't, don't be afraid, it's okay. I've got plenty more. What's your name, little man? Um, I'm Archie, ma'am. Archie, I'm Amber. It's nice to meet you. Here, eat something. Look, you look like you could use some strength. I'll very cautiously um, stick out my stick out my hand and take the biscuit and grab it so she can't like pull it back, right? Yeah. She... And then. She releases the biscuit, sees you munch on it, and motions to a doorway a little bit down the alley and says, would you like to come in away from the rain? It's, it's warm inside, there's a fire, there's some more biscuits. I'm shaking a little bit and I just, as I'm munching, I just nod and I kind of waddle towards her. leads you down a half flight of stairs into a half submerged room underneath the walkways of the street there's a little bit of water leaking in from the side some pools forming on the ground but the center of the room is dry enough there's some tables here there's a small fire going on one of the, the walls there's a the tables have chairs stacked on them it looks like this is maybe some sort of defunct tavern or some sort of old dining room or something that has been sort of abandoned. You can see that there's like a doorway leading into a, a long defunct kitchen. Uh, there's cracked dishes on the ground around here, but the, the, the bar section inside the kitchen still has a barrel on it that looks freshly tapped with still a little bit of some sort of fluid le uh, leaking from it. And she pulls out a, a chair for you heads back into that defunct kitchen and brings you out three more biscuits and sets them down on a dirty, cracked plate for you. Um, and then looks you over a little bit and says, Archie, right? You look like quite the strong lad. What are you doing begging for scraps in the, in the back alleys of Clydesdale? I look at her with big eyes and kind of look back and forth, back and forth between her and like the biscuits on the plate. Um, and I'll say, I don't have anywhere else to go. I thought that might be the case. Well, I can always use an assistant. You can stay here. It's not much. There's a room in the back where you can make up some sort of bed if you can find anything for it. And uh, there's a kitchen. It works. And we've got enough food to feed ourselves for a little while. I've got some plans of making some money, but I'm gonna need some help. I need a, a strong lad to help me out with this. Do you think that could be you? I'm gonna glance at the biscuits one more time, and then I'm gonna nod profusely. I'm gonna say, yes, yes, yes. I, I can, I can lift a lot of things. I can do a lot of work. I'm, good. I'm, um, yeah. Good, good. She pats you on the head, um, lets you finish the biscuits while she sort of watches you in silence. Um, and once it's all done, she shows you around the area. There's this big common room. Uh, there is a small room that clearly used to be an office. There's still like a, a desk here, but it's long been opened and all the things taken from it. It's kind of, it teeters. It's not a great desk. Most people probably wouldn't want yeah. it, but she's moved it to the side and brought in this like big pile of hay stuffed into a sack that she's been using as a bed. She shows you that there's room for more all we got to do is get you a sack and some hay and you've got a bed. And then she shows you the kitchen. There's still like a, a small functioning sto uh, fireplace in there where she had the, the biscuits made. 
There's another fireplace in the main common room. And that's pretty much everything here. It's just these three rooms. There's a staircase that goes to the whatever is above on the next floor in the building, but that has been um, walled off. There's like uh, bricks going across yes. the ground. Um, so it doesn't work anymore. She'll tell you that she's found this abandoned place, broke her way in, and has been living here for a couple of months. No one seems to be the wiser. Uh, she's got this plan. She's got a plan to make a whole bunch of money, but it's a two-person job. See, she needs someone to help her break in through those bricks on that staircase and get into the building above which has been oh. renovated by this new noble family that's moved into Clydesdale, bought up some cheap property, and is sort of retrofitting it or um, refurbishing it, I think is the right word, yes. in order to, to make it like a nice livable home. This nice new noble family is none the wiser that the very bottom floor, which is condemned and leaky and no one wants, um, has been taken over by her for these purposes. She'll tell you the story about this, this family. They're this new blood noble family. They're horse breeders. They own some villages outside of Clydesdale and have raised the horses that have won the last three yearly tournaments in Clydesdale, the horse racing tournaments. And because of this, they've been promoted from just like horse breeding family to a noble family because they've been raising the very greatest horses around for three years in a row. And if you're going to call yourself Clydesdale, you would better have the best horses. And so sure. newly appointed nobles. Hard to become a noble family in this day and age. He tells you that with their new nobility, they have found quite a bit of wealth. And she thinks it's stored here in their house in town. Her plan, very simple. Break the way through the those bricks that have walled off the staircase slowly, quietly, over enough time that no one notices and hears. It means she's gonna build like some sort of um, scaffolding so that like as brick as the mortar between bricks is removed, you can just like leave the brick there. So if someone glances at that part of the floor or whatever, wherever this happens to be, they won't notice the bricks like dropping out. And then yeah. once all the grouting is removed from between the bricks, you'll just remove the scaffolding, remove the floor, sneak on up, steal at whatever it is that you need, and then the two of you can flee. She's gonna split it 30-70 with you, 70 for her, 30 for you, um, you know, cause she came up with the plan and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, then the two of you will be free to go your own ways or work together on another job. You know that this crime what she is intending to commit carries with it a death sentence. Not a great position to be in. And she gives you one more chance to opt out of the mission. Um, I think Archie has a decent concept of like um, money and like what he could do with it in a situation, right? But I think he does want to kind of inquire how much this 30% would entail for him. Not in terms of like numbers, but in terms of like consequences for him. Like, does this mean he'll permanently have a warm place to sleep? Or does this mean he can not just scavenge for, for scraps on the street for the next for the next time coming, right? Like he, he wants to know that there is like some real positive consequences for him like tied to this, you know? So he's gonna like inquire a little bit about it how much this 30% would be. You know, with the amount of money we can take from these guys, we could we could go off and buy our own houses somewhere. Maybe in Clydesdale, maybe over in Rockway. You, you could buy real property with what we're gonna take. Or you could travel the world, moving from port to port, traveling from city to city. If you live cheaply enough, you, you, this could take you for years and years enough money here that you wouldn't have to know hunger ever again if you wanted. Archie's eyes will widen and um, he'll remember the times that he was in the street and he was treated like very poorly by like noble people, you know, spat on, kicked, called names and everything, right? Um, 
and he'll agree to do the job. have some notes that I can't find. Hold on. Log in. talks to you about the plan and the very next day after you guys rest that night she will help you go through town she'll buy she'll steal a sack from one of these merchants using you as a distraction she has you like stumble over and knock over a table um, and then while the shopkeeper comes to like pick everything up and admonish you for knocking over the table she grabs a couple of bags from the rest of the things and hurriedly scurries away um, what do you say after, like, when you go to knock over the table of stuff and the shopkeeper comes over to admonish you and starts berating you and yelling at you for being, like, an idiot and not noticing what's going around, um, what do you say to the shopkeeper? Um, to, like, distract him? Yeah, or just as someone is coming and yelling at you for this, what, you know, they're, they're clearly distracted setting up the table again and restacking the clothing or the cloths and refolding them yelling at you the whole while like you stupid idiot heck you gotta look where you're going you knocked everything over look this is all dirty now i gotta clean it this is wet it's gotta dry who's gonna pay for this if it gets damaged what are you thinking kid uh i'll just start inquiring about like listen i was just looking for a i, I was just looking for a, a, a pair of pants i i, I need you can't I afford need a pair of pants these. what are you doing look at you listen, street I'm, urchin I'm just... Beggar. I, I, listen, I'm just I, look how look how ripped all my clothes are. I just I just need something to, to put on. I'm cold. Get out, out of there. here! I'll raining. call the guards on you. I'll have them throw you in the stockades. She waves a finger at you. Um. I'll. Um. Uh, I'll start stumbling out, and like knock over a little bit something again, and like be like, oh, I'm I'm so terribly sorry. I'm so sorry. As yeah. I um, as I like pick up another like pair of pants and kind of try to look at it, she'll snatch the pair of pants for you from you and start shouting into the the rest of the open air market for the guards to come and like take you away, or you know at least get you out of her shop area. And you can see a pair of soldiers walking on over. They've got um, breastplates made out of bronze. They carry spears, shin guards, um, pleated skirt, not pleated skirt, like a leather skirt with uh, studs across it typical hoplite type armor um, and they start pushing their way through the crowd towards you you got plenty of time to run away if you want or to confront them your call um i will book it wise idea yeah book it you'll meet back up with amber she'll grab some uh she'll bring you to a barn where you guys can steal some hay and stuff one of these bags so that you'll have a, a proper bed bring you back to the abandoned inn abandoned tavern down below and work with you to help eke some more biscuits because it appears all she has is flour, water um, a little bit of butter and some yeast that she's managed to steal from a bakery all you really got are biscuits or I guess and cakes she prefers biscuits and she'll next morning or later that day work on chipping out that grout between these stones. Yes. What? You've spent maybe a day with Amber now. She seems sort of kind-hearted. She clearly wants something out of you, but she's definitely going out of her way to be the person to steal things to provide for you a little bit. Um, and she keeps talking about how she could really use a, a good, strong lad for this job. Yeah. And... 
as of yet, she's not really mentioned what she needs the strong lad for. Her plan is just, you know, open a hole in the ground and steal everything from inside. But your role in all of this is still pretty undefined. Um, what do you... What does a young Archie feel about this? Well, um... I, I do see this, like, middle-aged woman, and I feel like... I Like, I do have some sort of idea about, like, how, okay... Well, number one, I'm not really sure what we're getting from there. Like, I'm not sure if she'll be able to carry everything that we need from there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, like, the first thought that I have. Um, the other thought is, like, I've been in fights um, mm -hmm. on the streets and everything, and... Um, and then there's a reason that I'm as strong as I am. I'm obviously thinking that, hey, she probably, this woman probably doesn't want to get involved in a fight if it mm. comes this far. But as someone who, you know, on the streets, all I kind of had was my my strength to fend for myself. It's like a point of pride for me, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea that someone would want me for that is kind of, um, it's kind of, um, validating in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where, like, I feel like, okay, maybe she doesn't want to be involved in a fight. Maybe she sees me as someone who could, like, protect her if we do get into a fight. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's, like, not necessarily a bad feeling. Yeah, it's nice to be wanted, to be needed for the yeah. things that you're good at. It's an amazing feeling. So you'll be with her as she has like helped. The two of you will construct this scaffolding and she will work very carefully with a small hammer and a small chisel to slowly break through the, the grout and the cement holding these bricks together. Um, and after a couple of days, you guys have pulled out enough bricks that if you gently lower the scaffolding down somehow, you'll be able to crawl on up through and enter the building above. Um, and the, the day, or I should say, yeah, you're going to go in at night. Of course you don't, you want to go in while everyone's asleep. So that day during the day, she looks at you and goes, so kid, Archie, do you know how to, do you know how to fight? I would like crack my knuckles a little bit. Right. And, um, I look at her and just say, I've been in more fights than you can imagine. Good, good. Do you know how to, how to use a weapon? Um, so I think Archie's used, like, probably daggers that he's found in the streets before. He's never really called a weapon his own. It's just always, like, weapons get passed around, taken from you. Mm -hmm. Um, And Archie's going to say, I, I know my way around a weapon, but the weapons I trust the most are these two right here yeah, you lift up your fist and she looks at him and yes. goes okay well for part of what we're doing here is we're gonna need some intimidation and as strong as you are a man with fists isn't nearly as scary as a man with a sword and she will produce a wrapped up two-handed sword but it is not the you know when you when you think of two-handed swords, like this brilliant gleaming blade that you could easily use to hack someone into bits. And what she produces is this like antique weapon that someone pulled out of a bog that's like half rusted with like chips out of it. And the, the cross guard is like missing one half of the side and the, the binding around the tang is sort of like falling apart. And even the wood around the tang is kind of like chipped off. It's the most questionable weapon you've ever seen in your life. Um, yep, and certainly. I've seen a lot of questionable weapons in my time. <laughs> yeah, certainly you could hurt someone with it. Um, yeah. But really, it's for the intimidation factor. Um, and she hands this over to you carefully and says, uh, Now, when we're in there, if anyone shows up, I want you to yell and scream and wave this in their face and scare the ever-living lights out of them, all right? They... We don't want them to even try to put up a fight. I'm sure you could take them, but it's better if things don't come to violence. It's one thing to steal from nobles. It's another thing to attack them or kill them, you know? I nod. Good. Well, tonight's the night, Archie. I got your back. You got mine? I'll look her in the eyes and I'll nod. I got yours. 
She reaches out a hand to clasp yours. And then together, the two of you can lower the scaffolding and crawl through the hole in the floor into the building above you. It appears that Amber knows what she's doing. Somehow she already seems to know the layout of this house. Um, she immediately, well, the, the floor that you guys come up through has been return has been uh, renovated into a fireplace. So you're like pulling out the floor of the fireplace and all this soot and ash and charred wood yep. comes down. And then she lifts up the grate that the wood is supposed to sit on and lowers it down into here as well. Crawls up through the space, out through the uh, fireplace, covered in dirt, pulls you up through as well and begins to look through this house for valuables. And she makes a beeline for a door, heads into a hallway, goes down the hallway past two doors, and in through another door on the opposite side, like she knows where everything is. Um, all the while yeah. whispering and waving you along with her. In this room, there's a box. She sets to the box, pulls out some picks and thieves tools that were folded into her shirt somewhere, and sets to work on the box. That's when you hear something from above. The floor above you, there's like a, a stepping on the floorboards. She looks to you, motions in the hallway. It's a staircase upstairs. Take that sword, go wave it around in whoever's face that is. Really, really scare them. But don't make so much noise that anyone outside would hear, okay? Uh, I'll give you a holler. I'll, I'll chirp three times. I'll go, ah, 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 and, and that'll be the sign to let you know to come downstairs, hop through the fireplace, and we'll be out of here, okay? It'll just take me five more minutes to get through this box. Archie's um, heart is kind of racing at this point. Um, he's been in danger before, but um, obviously this kind of thing is um, still pretty, pretty nerve-wracking, but also he doesn't feel like he can do anything else at this point, and also he trusts this woman, so he'll nod, he'll hold down to the sword tightly, and he'll go up the stairs. Yep, sure enough, um, it is the the man of the house that's coming down. He's, I don't know, 36 years old, uh, carefully groomed, uh, what do you call it, like a goatee, you know, just covering the, the bottom of his chin his hair, even though he's like clearly woken up from a nap, is like still greased over from the last day, and he's definitely run his hands through it to make it look sort of nice. Um, and he has in his hand a, a candle sitting in like a, a clear glass tube so that the wind doesn't um, blow it out. And he's coming down the hallway as you come up the stairs to see him. Um, the candle doesn't shed that much light, so you can see him maybe 10 feet away from you before he can even see you. What are you going to do? Um, I'm just going to say, don't move. Don't make a sound. I have a weapon. And stops in the hallway and says, uh. I'll like step closer to him, kind of make sure that he can hear my footsteps and maybe mm -hmm. make them sound a little bit heavier. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll repeat what I said before. Do you come within the radius of the candlelight? Um, I'll try. I think I'll try to stay a little bit out of it. Okay. Van slowly and quietly says, "You've made a grave mistake, son. You should go now, or you get in trouble." Archie will start shaking a little bit, but he's also kind of committed to this now, so he'll repeat what he said. Don't man, move. Don't make a sound. The man slowly begins to walk backwards, like carefully putting one foot and then shifting the weight, carefully putting the next foot and starts to retreat down the hall. I will repeat again. I said, do not move as I step closer to him, kind of following his steps. He tosses more. the candle in glass in your direction and at the same time runs the other way. Uh, I guess I'll make an attack roll for him to see if he hits you with the candle glass. He's not a trained fighter or anything and he's not really seeing exactly where you are, so he gets some penalties to it. 
Uh, it doesn't, you know, he throws it, it hits the wall next to you, the glass breaks, shatters, the candle flickers and goes out, and the room is plunged almost into darkness. The only light now is the window at the far end of the hallway, um, and you can see the silhouette of this noble man running for the window. As he approaches the window, he begins to shout, Guards! Guards! Help! Help! What are you going to do, Archie? Are you going to kill him? We'll flinch from the glass hitting the wall, um, and I'll make a snap decision and run for him, and I'll attack him with my sword. Okay. Um, you are not proficient in broken two-handed swords, so make me an attack roll. It's going to be a d20 uh, minus two because you're not proficient. Um, and there would normally be a bonus of one from your strength, Let's figure out how old you are at this point in time. Um, are you we said like Go ahead. young lad, right? I was I was thinking probably like mid late teens, like 15, 14. Okay. Um, something so you, along like in that range. Yeah, your strength probably isn't fully developed, um, but it's on its way. So you probably have like 16 strength right now, which would give you a plus one to damage, but not a plus one to hit. So go ahead and make me a d20 minus two because you're not proficient. And then another minus two because it's really dark in here, but there's like enough light that you can kind of see something. So D20 minus four at the silhouette of the man running from you. It's a terrible did I do that right? Yeah, you did that Jesus absolutely Christ. right. Uh, you rolled like crap and you got huge penalties. Yep. So you bring your two-handed sword up and it like sticks into the ceiling above you in this small narrow hallway. And as you bring it forward, like the blade snaps with half the blade in the ceiling and half the blade now in front of you, completely missing the attack. Uh, but the guy has gotten to the windows, thrown them open and shouting for the guards. Next round. You've got him um... cornered. You are between him and any other door. You are on the second floor, out the window, and then down to the ground is maybe a, um, I guess with the half floor that's down below here, it's maybe a 25 foot drop. So he can't jump out the window without endangering his life. What are you gonna do, Archie? There has not like been to... the cuckoo from downstairs. I would like to repeat one more time for him to shut up. Give me a charisma or, check. How do I do that? Uh, you're gonna click on the CHR on your character sheet, or you can roll a d20 plus 12, because that's your charisma stat. Uh, Great, yeah. He sees the menace in your eyes. He sees that you did try to kill him and just failed to do it, and slinks down by the window. It's real quiet. It says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Don't hurt me. And that's when you hear the door downstairs bust open um, and the sound of armored guards running through hallways. Sounds like there's no way out for me, huh? Yeah. You still haven't heard Amber call for you and as you sit there trying stand there trying to figure out what to do coming up the stairs behind you is a group of guards uh, and they are covered in bright light um, it's as if magical light is extending around them in a large aura and it floods the hallway and you can see that you are quickly outnumbered by trained guards in heavy armor with spears well I, they probably have short swords if they're inside the house um, they left their spears outside. Um, what do you want to do? Archie is extremely intimidated by these men. He's never like dealt with this level of, um, I guess, security before. Mm -hmm. um, he will freeze up and drop his weapon. All right. Man comes to his full height wife comes out of the bedroom eventually their kids come out of their respective rooms eventually other guards show up um, they walk through the house it's clear how you guys got in you tracked soot through everything and it's clear that the chest that 
Um, Amber was opening, was expertly opened, and everything from within it has been removed. And it's hard to judge the timing of these things, but the guards definitely didn't see her when they were knocking down the doors, when they were coming into the house. And it becomes very clear to you personally that Amber probably had the, the box open by the time you got to the top of the stairs. Just took literally everything from the box, didn't call for you, left you as a person to uh, take the fall for her. And you get questioned by the guards in the moment. Who was with you? Who was your partner? What do you say to them? Um, I will stay quiet. Do you think Amber is coming back for you or that she tried to get to you and it didn't work out? Or do you feel like she actually abandoned you here? She did work with you for like five days to get ready for this task. I fed you for five yeah. days. At, at this point, I definitely trust Amber more than I trust the authorities, which I've had no good experience with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you get hauled off to jail that night. Amber doesn't come for you. How could she? You're in jail. I mean, Grant, yeah, your window does see to the outside, but, like, she doesn't show up. And a few days pass, and she doesn't show up. And a few more days pass, and you're brought before a courtroom. Uh, people haven't really questioned you, aside from that, like, who was your partner? And they seem comfortable without asking any more questions. The guards bring you up, They say that you were part of a group of thieves stealing from a noble house. Um, They ask the judge for the maximum sentence, uh, which is in this situation, disfigurement. They will take your left hand for this task. And the judge looks down at you, a young lad in the 16 years of age. He says, "Uh, boy, how old are you? 16, sir. I don't quite feel comfortable taking the hand of a 16-year-old man. Uh, it's possible that a criminal is all you are and all you will ever be, but it's also possible that a young man like you has been duped into a way of thievery. Instead, we will sentence you to indentured servitude. Now, your, you and your assistant, whoever they were, ended up stealing 5,000 gold from the family. And in your head, you you know that 5,000 gold is a lot of money. You know, 5,000 gold is, is more money than most people of like the peasant or servant class will see in their lifetime. That is, you know, an absurd amount of money. And he's like an apple cost in this in this world. Um, like two sil- two copper, maybe one copper, one copper. So, okay. w- one gold could buy a hundred apples. So fifty five thousand gold buys fifty thousand five hundred thousand apples. It's a lot. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, he sentences you to indentured servitude at regular laborer wages, which is a silver a day. Um, That's 30 gold a year until you've paid back all 5,000 gold, which is essentially a lifetime sentence. Um, Of course, if you, you know, the family likes you, they can, they can opt to pay you more pay you more against your debts or if they're an evil corrupt family they can charge you for room and board and whatnot and your debt will only increase it is a a corrupt system and you are sentenced to essentially a lifetime of indentured servitude to the family from which you stole your stuff they don't ask you to speak in your defense they don't really call any witnesses other than the man who you intimidated and the guards who found you And before you get a chance to say anything, the hammer comes down and the guards put shackles on you, hand the key to uh, the the family from which you stole. Um, They are the 
the Roan family, R-O-A-N. And they lead you away in shackles back to the very same house that you stole from. And Mr. Roan, Lord Roan, will tell you your first job is to brick up that entire fireplace. Not just the floor, but the whole thing. Never again are we going to let someone in from the bottom. Um, and you'll hear through conversation that they abandoned the bottom floor because there's no way to stop the leakage and the water that comes in. And that it has this peculiar smell which they can't get rid of. And it's just like, you know, a shitty part of the house they just want to board off forever. Um... How do you feel about being an indentured servant forever? I mean, you'll get food, you'll get clothing, you'll get a warm, dry place to sleep, but you will lose all agency in your life. Um, I think Archie knows two things after this. Mm -hmm. Um, I think he knows that he will never be, be betrayed again because he knows by this point that Amber betrayed him. Mm -hmm. And he knows that he probably should have pushed the men out of the window. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And every day that he works for him is just kind of reinforces that thought. How does Archie behave? Like, are you easily going along with this indentured servitude? You're physically stronger than the the man who owns your contract right now. You could just say no and beat the shit out of him and try and run away. Um, or you could take to it and just, you know, scrub floors and hang coats and wash dishes and take horses out for walks. What is it? Um, how does Archie respond to this enslavement? I think Archie will accept his fate. Um, will accept this task that he's been given. And I think deep down, um, he finds some sort of comfort in the fact that every day he can wake up and be given a thing to do instead of having to rummage the streets on his own. Give me a charisma check then for how well the family takes to you. Like, are you a, a likable fellow for them? Are you an annoying fellow for them? What do they think of you? Oh my god. Fucking Archie. You 21 or higher is a success. So a 16, they're just like, this piece of shit. He, he smells funny. He talks weird. Um, he's none too bright. We have to explain things to him a couple of times. It's clear that the Roan family is not exactly thrilled with this situation. But they hold on to you for a few years. And I think, as you said earlier, you get kind of comfortable in this spot. They're maybe a little bit mean or a little bit dismissive, a little bit like insulting your intelligence. Um, but they're not bad. They don't beat you. They don't abuse you. You eat well. You're dressed fairly nicely because you, like, work in their house. And so they have guests come over. And they can't have some dirty little peasant walking around their house, right? So you, they make you presentable. But you can feel that they are just really frustrated with you. Which is why two years later, um, one day, you are introduced to a man. This man owns a ship. Well, owns a company that deals with the hiring and employing of various uh, crew members for ships. It's sort of like a, a talent agency or a recruitment agency. They go around looking for cheap labor that they can buy up and then resell that labor to ships. And they have come to the Roan family in order to buy your contract. And the Roan family is more than happy to trade away your labor for pure cash. Just, we're gonna sell this kid, 
He is now and forever going to work on a ship. He's going to be a rower. And we're just going to get, you know, half of his wages or two thirds of his wages that he would make rowing this boat um, as cash. So a deal is done and you are handed over to this man whose name you don't even learn before he hands you over to a ship captain somewhere. And you are just sort of like, all right, your job as a rower. This guy's going to teach you how to row. You're going to row until your contract is paid off. As a rower, though, you are going to make a lot more than you would as a laborer. So you're going to be paying off your contract a little bit quicker instead of having to work for like, what was it? You owed 5000 And a laborer generally makes about uh, 30 so instead of having to work 166 years to pay off your debt, uh, you will only have to work. Where is? Ah, here we go. Oops. You will only have to work 55 years to pay off your uh, indentured servitudeness. Wow. Quite the raise. Yeah, it was pretty good, you know? Pretty... Pretty good. And I think that's where we're going to end our first chapter here. Archie has been down on his luck. Someone promised him good things and took care of him for a little while before abandoning him to run away with a bunch of money sold into indentured servitude, which is in this case is practically slavery, sold again, away from everything you've ever known, everyone you've ever known, and onto a bunch of boats, ships. Um, and when we come back from our break, we are going to meet up with you and Nick, and we're gonna continue this sort of like backstory, and we're gonna figure out how the two of you met and how the two of you um, came to be such good friends or such close compatriots. So we will see you guys on the other side of our break with a little bit more Tides of Death. <laughs> 